color saturation, and pattern uniqueness. All these things make precious stones very attractive to people. The durability and complexity of stone decoration has placed stone processing work into a special category, that of jewelry art. Semi-precious stones contain striking mysteries which can only be revealed under the hands of a true artist. When speaking of stone, we first of all mean large forms. There are cities in the architecture of which you may hear a real stone symphony. One such city is St. Petersburg, the northern capital of Russia, or, as it is sometimes called, Northern Venice. Its stone splendor lures tourists from all over the world. Large sculptures, huge columns, monumental stone construction, embankment bridges and pavement, all these are elements of everyday scenery for the modern city dweller. Right here, in this stone city in 1973 at the Russian Museum, an exhibition of Vasily Konovalenko's stone sculptures was opened. Ten sculptural compositions made from precious stones and metal were exhibited in the museum rooms right next to the rooms holding pieces by Surikov and Repa. Anna Konovalenko, the artist's wife, remembers this day down to the tiniest detail. There were lots of questions, applause, and enthusiastic speeches. I can't say that it was an unhoped for success. We anticipated it, but not so much as it turned out to be. 25,000 copies of the exhibition catalog were sold out in three days. There was a stream of people coming up with these booklets, asking for his autograph under every picture printed in the booklet. Some of them tried to touch Vasily, to make sure he was real, an actual person living in this land. Writer Sergei Mikhailkov, a huge admirer of the master's talent, took part in organizing the exhibition. They were looking, they were amazed and delighted at the pieces, and they congratulated the master. The figures were made from multicolored stones and performed with great humor. The sculptor immediately became famous. In the newsreel of those years, he was depicted in the process of his work. Vasily Konovalenko, like all other artists, used to work with paints, but when he once saw semi-precious stones, he, like the well-known fairy tale character Danila the Master, became addicted to stone. He decided to pour his life into it to make stone figures. In newspapers and magazines, Vasily Konovalenko was compared to either the folk character Danilo the Master or the Russian court jeweler Karl Fabergé. Larisa Yakovleva, a scientific associate of the Hermitage Museum, is an expert on Fabergé art pieces. He is unique even in the theme itself, in the theme as well as the work. He knows Somov very well. As a scene painter, he sees these physiognomies very clearly, and he reflects it in the material very well. All the images were brought to life from rough sketches. However, Konovalenko's work was so individual that it can't be compared to Fabergé's work at all. It's unfair with respect to Konovalenko. He was individual in everything. In everything he did, he is perceived as a master. He deserves both an independent opinion and an independent name. Vasily Konovalenko was born in Ukraine in 1929. Since his childhood, he was at his best in painting. After graduating from art school, 
Konovalenko worked in Donetsk and then in Kiev as a scene painter. In 1953, he moved to St. Petersburg and worked together with Suliko Versaladze on the settings of the Marinsky Theater. Here in St. Petersburg, he met his future wife, Anna, in the company of his friends. He came to me with his friend. They went to the kitchen, and all of a sudden the atmosphere became so alive because of all those stories they were telling. The stories were so mixed up, so different, but nevertheless complete. I was amazed at his appearance, which ran opposite to the image of a painter. He was such a tall man with broad shoulders and unbelievably beautiful hands. He radiated appeal and striking virility, which filled our entire apartment. I felt that he was a person of extraordinary will and fortitude. Once, with a lot of friends, we went to the sea, to Pitsunda, to have a rest. At that time, he had an order to make a colored stone picture. It was then that I realized he was an artist. But later, when I saw what he could do and how he did it, I was truly delighted and enthused. From 1953 to 1963, Konovalenko worked at the Marinsky Theater, making settings and costume sketches for different operas and ballets. From the memories of the theater critic, Irina Uvarova. It was very important that he work next to such an artist as Versaladze, but at the same time, he demonstrated sufficient enough independence, of course, in the way of color, and the freedom of his color strokes. While working as a scene painter, Vasily Konovalenko designed costumes and theater settings for many different productions during that time. Swan Lake, Boris Godunov, Aida, Traviata, La Bayadere, Gypsies, Romeo and Juliet, Spartacus, Ibolite, and Stoneflower. This is far from being a complete list of all his dramatic tasks and artistic solutions. In regards to the costumes, it was possible to feel the presence of the Baxt image, although there was no Baxt at the time. It feels like his shadow becomes alive in Konovalenko's actable pictures. This, by the way, greatly influenced his stone figures. How did it happen that a scene painter all of a sudden became famous all over the world in one of the most difficult genres, the genre of stone sculpture. In one of the documentaries made about Konovalenko at that time, there was a story about his shift from the theater to stone. The skill of stone cutting is a very difficult and laborious matter. Semi-precious stones are capricious, substantial, and fragile. Vasily Konovalenko followed the traditions of the art of Russian stone cutting and performed his compositions in the Russian folk genre with a humor so characteristic of him. He began his work as a theater painter. While working at the Stoneflower Ballet, he took an interest in the structure and appearance of minerals and started collecting them. After that time, the artist devoted his life to the stone flower of the belly of the earth. The Danila the Master sculpture was created after the tales by Pavel Bajov. The young master is holding his first work, a mountain green box. After a successful exhibition at the Russian Museum, the art of stone cutting completely absorbed the artist. Konovalenko then became a frequent visitor of stone cutting museums, both in Moscow and St. Petersburg. 
There he met geologists, who helped him in his work by bringing unique samples of stones back from their expeditions. By taking a plasticine model of his future sculpture as a basis, Konovalenko selected the best matching stones. This labor-intensive selection of materials, by colors and patterns, is particularly respected by mineralogical experts. Portions, polychromy, stonework mastery, the skill of beautifully matching and choosing exact colors and color correlations. All these are characteristic of a truly bright artistic personality. It is great art and we can't look at it any other way. The ability to work right on the edge of a bizarre style and the ability to add a touch of humor. Here there's a very bright variety of style and shades and it is doubtlessly the artist's forte which was revealed in the stone. In 1974, Vasily Konovalenko was invited to Moscow to work as the chief artist at the geology ministry. There, at the Samotsviati Museum, there were specially assigned rooms for his workshop. At that time, the museum was closed to visitors and served as storage for rare minerals. The stone-cutting sculptures made by Vasily Konovalenko took the place of honor at the museum and were a part of Russian and international exhibitions held every year. Museum officer Vladimir Chernovtsev speaks about his first meeting with Konovalenko. His honesty and open-heartedness were the first qualities that caught my eye. He had a magical skill of turning any companion into a friend if he or she had at least some mutual feelings. And we should give him his due. He saw every stone through and through. The unique collection of semi-precious stones of that museum allowed Konovalenko to learn more about them, while the company of geologists was rather habitual for him, dating from the time of his work in St. Petersburg. In that museum, Konovalenko organized the manufacture of metal and precious stone items. Jewelry and Jubilee government orders were created there. Illich's stone-peaked cap and boots from the unfinished sculpture Lenin at Community Work Day are still kept in the museum. During that time, Konovalenko created more and more monumental stone statues. Konovalenko didn't merely remember his Ukrainian background, but the way he created this statue even in terms of size, this composition is larger than the others. I saw Vasily Konovalenko's work for the first time several years ago. His name has always been in the hearts of Russian and Soviet stone-cutting artists. It was something like a legend, which passed from mouth to mouth. In the 90s, when many things changed, both in our life and our country, and for the first time people look back at the history of contemporary jewelry, many wonderful pages were as if they were open for the first time. For me, as a historian of applied art, studying the work of Fabergé and other Russian masters of the 19th and 20th centuries, it is very important that Vasily Konovalenko revitalized many jewelry genres and many techniques of the jewelry and stone-cutting arts. He was the first to make wonderful figures, stone sculptures, during Soviet times. He revitalized other methods of jewelry. For his large monumental sculptures, it was necessary to make jewelry accessories. It was just one step away from revitalizing the technique of enamel over filigree. The amazing techniques of jewelry itself, which now, at the time of going back to its roots, are the true basis of our jewelry. Konovalenko was the first to turn a purely folk theme, 
He didn't produce the national theme required of standard, officious art. He didn't make heroes out of laborers. He portrayed original folk life, as they called it, as if shining out from the inside. This makes Konovalenko's life similar to the lives of other remarkable Russian masters of the 20th century. Such as, for example, Pavel Avchinikov, who was also born in a village and achieved great success, as well as Klebnikov, Sazikov, and other Russian masters. Of course, he ran into strong opposition with his work, as it was running counter to Soviet and Russian art of that time, in portraying slightly drunk country peasants and emaciated village women. But Konovalenko had his own way, and his greatest achievement was his gallery of images. No one but Konovalenko, after such remarkable stone-cutting masters as Denisov Uralsky, Fabergé, and Avimir Sumin, could understand the real nature of Russian semi-precious stone. He could turn any defect of the stone into a strong point. He could transfer the drawbacks of the stones into their strong artistic sides. This ability to feel the stone, the ability to talk to it, as he used to say, without arguing, allowed him to achieve such remarkable results. It's impossible to overestimate his contribution to the history of the art of Russian stone cutting. Very often, Konovalenko is called another Fabergé, and these two masters are being constantly compared. Konovalenko never copied anything from anyone. Therefore, Fabergé's graceful and placid figures, as they were sometimes called, are quite different from Konovalenko's works, which, in my opinion, are more democratic in spirit and more statuesque. It isn't a small Fabergé's babylot. It is a truly large piece carved from magnificent stones. Its foundation is a smoke-colored quartz piece. The hippopotamus itself is made from mountain green with a splendidly huge ruby tongue. Like Fabergé, Konovalenko never sought direct naturalism in his works. He always tried to depict nature as bizarre, to distinguish some funny features. Implementing numerous creative concepts takes a lot of time, but he always found time to be with his family. In 1981, Vasily Konovalenko, together with his family, migrated to the USA, and this new perspectives for his work. To complete his numerous orders, Konovalenko organized a studio from the ground up for making stone-cutting sculptures and jewelry. They're all man-made, using the master's excellent choice of stones, amazing lightness, and genuinely Russian feeling. The use of jewelry accessories in his stone-cutting work inspired Konovalenko to think about further work with precious stones as well as developing his own jewelry genre. Konovalenko's jewelry expresses the artist's exquisite taste and skill, the originality of his technological solutions, and the uniqueness of his cutting breathed new life into the stones and complemented their natural strength with a man-made beauty.
professional masters worked on Konovalenko's sketches, but most of the stonework was still done by the artist himself. The wealthiest American people bought some of Konovalenko's sculptures to enrich their private collections. Larry Silverstein, the owner of the World Trade Center, bought two pieces himself. One of them, titled Woodcutters, decorates his residence. From this place, there is a delightful view of Manhattan. Three more pieces can be found in the private collection of the famous architect Elvin Kogan in a very picturesque suburb of Denver, Colorado. One of the sculptures is a frozen hunter who doesn't notice a hare hiding behind a nodule of calcite. Next to it, there is a natural mineral formation. Polished quartz crystals create an illusion of delicious mushrooms. The sculpture titled Gypsies is a frozen dance of semi-precious stones with mobile faces and eyes full of mischief. Solid, strong, magnificent figures. He filled them with real life. Why does he always have scenes, scenes, scenes? Just because he never stopped playing theater. But in his theater, he is the stage director. All this gives the composition a lot of charm, humor, and joy. In 1984, in the Denver National Museum in Colorado, there was the one-man show of the Russian artist Vasily Konovalenko. The top artistic figures of world art and culture were showcased in that huge exhibition complex. All in all, there were 22 stone-cut figures. Many compositions contained more than one figure. The exhibition was such a great success that it was extended to three months. At the end of this period, all the pieces of the collection were bought by the sponsors and permanently donated to the Denver Museum. It was the highest appreciation of the master's work in the jewelry world. Nowadays, Konovalenko's sculptures are permanently displayed in two separate halls. Many visitors come to Denver just to see the works of this Russian master.
During his lifetime, Konovalenko created from sketch to implementation in stone over 60 stone-cut sculpture compositions. Vasily Konovalenko not only surpassed his predecessors in the skill of seeing into the stone, in mastering all the secrets of the art of jewelry, he created a whole world of semi-precious stones which shines in the hearts of art connoisseurs with open-hearted folk humor and the vast depth of the Russian soul. It feels as if something unique, something hidden, opens for a brief second, something that Vasily Konovalenko saw within the stone itself. <laughs>